M650 KGAB, you're in tune with the Weekend in Wyoming program. On the phone line, I have Tim Thornell, CEO of Cheyenne Regional Medical Center. Good morning, sir. Good morning. And we're chatting about, obviously, the coronavirus and uh, the situation at CRMC in terms of preparations for that. First of all, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but so far you haven't seen all that many impacts at CRMC is in terms of an influx of patients. Am I right on that or am I incorrect? Yeah, no, that's really fairly accurate. We've only tested, I think, three people positive in the hospital itself. Um, and currently, um, I think we have uh, two patients in our ICU that are there who have tested uh, positive for coronavirus. We had one patient earlier who um, has since got better and was able to be discharged home. Now, we, we've heard a lot around the country about shortages of PPE, personal protective equipment. Are, are we in good shape at the hospital in that regard or not? Yeah, that's always a challenging question to answer. So we are certainly, I think, in a, in a decent situation today, but you have to appreciate the full scope of the situation, meaning um, we have a decent amount of personal protective equipment, um, but we're also using conservative measures. In, in utilization of our PPE. And that really comes as a, re, as a recommendation from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. And for any hospital that wants to participate and receive you know, supplies from the uh, National Strategic Stockpile uh, or from FEMA, who is gonna take control of a lot of the distribution of PPE, uh, you have to do two things. You have to um, stop doing elective surgical cases, which we have done a couple weeks ago. But then you also have to implement these um, conservative measures for preserving PPE. So we are doing that. So given that we are enacting our conservative measures, you know, today we have an adequate supply. The challenge is that can change at any time. If we get a huge spike in patients who um, have COVID or that we're testing for it and we burn through, use more PPE at a higher rate than we're used to, that may not last as long. And if our supplies that we ask for in replenishment don't come in, um, that's a challenge too. So it's hard to predict for the future. So um, I say yes, today we're okay, but that could change really quickly. And I should mention we are taking calls if you have any questions or comments. I would ask if you call in uh, while Mr. Thornell is speaking, you'd be patient for a moment before we put you on the air, but uh, we will get to you, I promise you that. Um, now, there, for those who haven't heard, first of all, there have been some rules changes on visitation effective this week at the hospital. Is that right? Yeah, correct. On uh, Thursday, you know, as we constantly evaluate what's the newest um, information coming in, what's the latest recommendations from the World Health Organization, from CDC, from our own Wyoming State Department of Public Health and our County Department of Public Health. And then we're so fortunate to have two infectious disease specialist physicians on our staff. And so we have specific guidance and they get to interpret those rules for us too. So we are constantly evaluating and adapting to the new information saying, what can we do to better protect our staff, which is really important to protect our healthcare staff so that they can stay healthy for the long term to take care of people and to protect the community. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we um, put up a limitation to say just, you know, one visitor along with a patient. And we actually started screening all of our staff as they came into the facility. So this week we just augmented our, um, criteria there and really said uh, no visitors um, for patients. Now there's obviously a few exceptions for that. Uh, pediatric patients coming in, they need to have a parent with them. Um, if you're going into labor, it's you know obviously uh, really nice to be able to have your spouse or significant other there with you. Um, certainly for compassionate measures where someone's end of life, we certainly want to allow and afford the family the ability to, to be there with that loved one. So there are a couple of circumstances that you know, genuinely allow us to have some visitors. But by general rule, uh, the fewer the people, the better um, coming through the hospital at this point. Okay, and just to clarify something you said, because I've seen some comment about this in other parts of the country, if, if you're a husband and your wife goes into labor, you're still allowed to come in, I guess. Is that right? We are, yes. I think other places may even have said no, but, but we are allowing that. And can they be there while the child is born and so forth? Uh, yes. So now I say yes, the caveat still is, we're going to screen them too. We're going to take their temperature, ask them a few questions. If they don't pass that screening, uh, then we will not let them in. But as long as they pass that screening procedure, they will be allowed to be there. 
Now, how about people at the emergency room? Let's say you, you break your leg. Is there any change in procedure for going to the emergency room at this point, just in general? Yeah, in, uh, in general, you know, we, we have, um, again, one entrance for that. We used to be able to have a couple different ways to get into the emergency room. So one entrance there, we do have kind of a, a soft stopping point where we do ask people if they're having any of these symptoms uh, related to COVID, you know, a, a fever over 100.0, um, dry coughing, some other symptoms. Uh, they kind of stop at that entry point, ring the bell, we'll come to them and get them some protective, uh, personal protective equipment so we can get them through the waiting room safely and into a designated spot. So other than just kind of pausing for a moment to make sure we're safely taking care of everyone waiting in that area too, that otherwise you have access to the ER as you really normally would. Uh, Mr. Thornell, question on my Facebook page. Let me see if I can put my glasses on here and read this. What are the visitor guidelines for the hos for the uh, Davis Hospice at this time? Anything new on that? So, yes. Yeah, so we've made you know similar um, guidelines for our, our entire system. So our healthcare system certainly includes the West Campus, the May Hospital, it includes our East Campus to the former um, DePaul Hospital. Um, where we have our inpatient behavioral health unit, we have our acute rehab unit, um, and then hospice too. And so there we've really tried to implement the same policies and procedures throughout so it's consistent, easier to follow. So at hospice, where we have an inpatient unit, um, yes, same policy where we prefer not to have visitors, but as you can imagine, hospice kind of inherently is a situation where people are end of life. So. Uh, we do make that compassionate allowance for for visitors in that context so there's a little more flexibility there there is yeah now you've basically well first of all just backtracking here for those who didn't hear you did have a couple nurses who tested positive this week is that right we did we had two two employees who tested positive both of them happen to be nurses one of them doesn't work in direct patient care um does some more administrative type nursing um functions for the most part and then uh, the other one does work in direct patient care um, but wasn't one who worked in one of our kind of designated areas that is um, specifically treating um, patients either with COVID or again because we only have a couple or ones that we're trying to rule out we think they might we're testing them and just waiting to see the results. Mr. Thornell? Neither one worked in those areas. Looks like we have a caller and good morning you're on the air with Tim Thornell from CRMC. Hello oh well, it looks like they went away. Okay. Um, now, obviously, and I don't know anything about the hospital industry and don't pretend to. I'm, I'm sure that you're pretty uh, pretty careful about uh, dis... Well, here we go get with the caller again. We'll put him back on the air here. Go ahead. You're on yeah, the air. I'm sure that you're pretty... Uh... Go ahead. Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Hi. I uh, just wanted to clear up a little bit of confusion. If somebody does come down positive... Are the doctors able to prescribe the chloroquine, and does the hospital have plenty of that in uh, stock? Thank you. Mr. Thornell? Yeah, so they're asking about the, the treatment, the potential uh, treatment for that. Um, and it's a good question. So our infectious disease physicians and our intensivists right now are evaluating whether that's the right treatment or, um, or not. So... Um, Currently, I'm not aware of any of the patients that are, we have, the, the two or three um, that have been put on that regimen. So I, I really don't have a good answer to say that we have an ample supply of that because we wouldn't have stocked it otherwise, I don't believe. And we certainly haven't received any uh, new shipments of that uh, treatment. Um, but I still think it's out for evaluation as to how effective that is. And my understanding is that's in kind of short supply anyway around the, around the country. Am I correct in that or do we know? It is. These, yeah, as soon as anything like this crops up, these things become in, in high demand and short supply very rapidly. Now, as I was starting to ask before the caller came in, I'm, you know, I'm sure a hospital is pretty careful about disinfecting and all of that anyway, just as a general procedure. Are there any special procedures you're taking internally because of COVID-19 that you weren't taking before? Uh, we are. So... Yes, as you indicated, we certainly have a, a fantastic uh, environmental services team who, you know, disinfects our hospital on a routine basis. Um, but to supplement that, we have some of our staff who, um, you know, some of our outpatient services are, are been diminished for this, um, for this purpose, obviously, for COVID going on. Um, so we've redeployed some of our staff to do additional cleaning. So 
So we actually have staff going around the hospital all the time cleaning high touch areas in particular. So uh, elevator buttons, door knobs, um, door handles, all those real high touch areas. And those are just being cleaned with such a greater frequency than ever before. Okay, again, in case you're just joining us, I'm speaking with um, Tim Thornell. Mr. Thornell is the CEO of Cheyenne Regional Medical Center. Obviously, uh, we're discussing the coronavirus, and I think at the outset of the program, we pretty well established that uh, certainly you haven't been hit by a deluge of patients, thankfully, at this point, that would, that would stretch your services thin. Is that a concern, though, that that, that might happen around here to the point where the, the, the health care just isn't available? Well, it has to be a concern. I mean, again, while we don't see that today, you have to look around the rest of the country and see that there's been pockets that have been significantly impacted, uh, Washington State, Seattle in particular, uh, Louisiana, and certainly right now New York is capturing a lot of the headlines and, and, and really seeing this significantly impact them. So we can't pretend that we're immune from this and not going to get to that level. So while we're doing everything we can to prevent from ever getting to that level and, and all of our community is doing to social distance, to wash your hands, all those things absolutely make a positive difference. So we're appreciative of everybody's efforts there. But we have to plan for, you know, that this event may happen here with that level of severity. So while we hope it never does. So we certainly have uh, plans to be able to expand capacity in the hospital to accommodate quite a few patients. Um, We're working to, you know, potentially uh, get a few more ventilators. We have 35 at the hospital at any given time anyway and we're working to acquire some more should that need ever arrive. Um, and then staffing is probably the biggest part. So you know, that's why, again, we're taking great efforts and links to protect our staff as much as anything. That's part and parcel why we decrease visitors. We just want to decrease the exposure that our staff have to potentially get in this virus. Because you can imagine at whatever point uh, we would see a big influx, a big surge, our staff will be susceptible to it too as they're out in the community and we can't afford to have them not available to take care of patients. So I think one of our bigger risk points is not necessarily having beds. I think we'll have plenty of those and we'll hopefully have enough ventilators and other equipment, Um, but we need to make sure we have enough staff to to take care of everyone if if this happens. Now you mentioned you have 35 ventilators right now. You're hoping to get more. Do you have a target number in mind for how many you'd like to have ideally? So we're trying to uh, increase that um, by about 10 more ventilators. Uh, and then as you also can see around the country, there's some hospitals that have um, figured out how to put multiple patients on ventilators. So we're exploring that option as well um, to, to have potential increased capacity, again, should that need arise. Mr. Thornell, looks like we have a caller on the line. Good morning. You're on the air with Tim Thornell from CRMC. Uh, yes, sir. i just like to find out. So if you're not going to use the drug, they're just going to end up dying or you're not going to even try it or what? on the the chloroquine yeah so again right now our our uh, physicians are evaluating now the best utilization of that if that's the right drug to use then we will do everything we can to make it available and and use it as as recommended and there is some national testing going on in that regard as well am i correct Uh, there's a lot of good national research going on right now in the form of uh, uh, trying to figure out some more tests to try and figure out some um, treatment methodologies. There's been some exploration of look, patients who have had um, COVID-19 and recovered from it. Is there an opportunity to use their plasma to introduce some antibodies? Uh, they're exploring all those things at this point in time. What, what, what is the procedure, for, so people know, for evaluating, say, uh, and I don't even know how you pronounce it, chloroquine or however you say it, what sort of testing does that go through before somebody decides, yeah, this is a good thing to use or no, we shouldn't use it? How does that work? Yeah, and, and I'm not going to be able to answer that as adequately as, I, as uh, you'd probably like. Um, you know, for anything there, it, it's certainly a, a, something that's been available. So, but really what you're looking at is a new use for it. Um, so ideally, you know, the FDA would be involved and you'd go through some trials to evaluate if this is truly effective or uh, or not in these kind of situations where things are thrust upon us so quickly um, sometimes we can move a little bit quicker to try to determine if it is the right um, you know right solution to the problem that we have here so um, you know I think that's where they are right now in terms of trying to evaluate if this is 
uh, you know, the, the right treatment methodology or not. Mr. Thornell, now, if someone has the symptoms of, uh, of COVID, which, of course, can be mimicked by the flu and even, even a severe cold, let's say there's somebody out there listening today and their temperature is a little high and they don't feel good, what, what should they do? Because they know the testing is somewhat limited. What procedure should they follow? Yeah. The CDC has some great guidelines, and you can go online at cdc.gov and immediately pops up their, their COVID page. And you can click on on there and uh, follow some guidelines they have. But really, what we're suggesting is, if you're presenting with symptoms, you're at home, and you're presenting with symptoms. You've taken your temperature and it's high; it's over 100.0. Um, you're experiencing some um, uh, respiratory issues, but it's not really uh, impacting your life. Meaning you can't, you, you know, you can still breathe. It's just it's, it's annoying. Um, and you're experiencing some of those symptoms. You know, the recommendation right now is call your primary care provider. Um, and again, ideally call them, don't just go in, but call them, uh, let them know your symptoms, what's going on, and then they'll be able to give you some great advice and some direction on the severity of what you're experiencing and should you go and, and just get tested for it from an outpatient perspective uh, just to see if you have it. Um, should you just stay at home and self-quarantine and, and wait out the symptoms, which is frequently the advice, um, or if your symptoms are really you know exacerbated and worse, then they may recommend you go into an urgent care or an ER setting and actually be seen and uh, potentially treated. But really recommending that you get a hold of your primary care provider to give you some good advice and guidance on how best to um, how best to um, address that situation that you have. And my understanding from various media releases I've seen is that unless your conditions are just really severe on the border of maybe being life-threatening, you're not really being encouraged to hit the emergency room. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so again, if you're just experiencing more, you know, cold and flu-like symptoms, uh, then yes, the recommendation typically is from your, again, call your provider, but your recommendation will typically be to, you know, stay at home and really treat those symptoms. Um, but yes, if you ever get to the point where, look, I, I mean, I just really feel like I need to be seen, I think this, you know, potentially merits hospitalization then that's where the ER certainly comes into play. And that includes things like, I guess, a bluish tone to your lips and that sort of thing. Yeah, it can include that. Um, you know, certainly the respiratory distress is probably one of the more significant uh, symptoms that we'll look for. It's 50 KGAB, you're in tune with the Weekend in Wyoming program. I'm speaking with Cheyenne Regional Medical Center CEO Tim Thornell. He's on the phone line as we speak. Uh, There is an open line if you have any questions or comments, 632-3323. I think we've kind of covered the uh, chloroquine thing for now, but I would would encourage you if you have any other questions or comments uh, to feel free to give us a call here. We have just a few minutes left in the program. Uh, Tim, how confident are you about your readiness to handle the situation as it may develop? You feel good about it or are you worried about it? How do you feel about it? Hello? 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 Sorry, I put myself on mute during the commercial. <laughs> okay. Uh, how, 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 um, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm, you know, I feel both the sentiments, honestly. I feel, you know, confident that we are taking this extremely seriously, that we are putting forth every effort that we can to prepare for such a time that we would see a, a huge influx uh, of patients related to uh, the, the COVID-19 virus. Um but certainly, you know, it, there's a lot to look forward to and a lot to anticipate that we just don't know. So, you know, we certainly go into this with a little bit of trepidation, thinking, um, trying to figure out what are we not thinking of and how can we even better prepare? And certainly what lessons can we learn from those around us in the country right now that are experiencing it? What lessons can we learn? Yeah, well, I, I think um, certainly we can learn that um, it is working what we're doing with social distancing. It is working with everyone um, washing their hands, using soap and water when you can, um, and hand sanitizer when you can't. All these things are truly making a positive impact, um, reducing the amount of people coming through the hospital, all those, and keeping our healthcare workers you know, as safe as we can. Uh, those are all making a difference because it's really reducing, preventing the spread. So I think Wyoming's in a good place for the moment in the sense of, uh, we still have opportunity to flatten the curve, as we say, to really prevent the spread from getting as as um, 
dynamic as it can be. But we have an inherent advantage a little bit of just being a little more open and spread out. It's not such a densely populated area. So I think we're seeing certainly the, the densely populated areas having a little bit of a disadvantage by virtue of that. So um, our lessons learned are to continue down that path and again to uh, ensure that we have to our best efforts enough personal protective equipment to last us for uh, the long run, which again may be weeks, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Now, and of course, the, the first thing here is human lives, and we all understand that. But looking at it from a, a purely financial view, I do know that um, Wyoming hospitals were looking at, uh, I think, statewide something like $100 million in uncompensated care the last few years, if I remember right, and I could be wrong on this. CRMC was something like $20 million. Are you concerned about a deluge of uncompensated care and that causing financial issues? Yeah, well, it's certainly a um, you know, stressful time for hospitals. Um, and, and the finances play a part of that stress. So if you think about how hospitals operate, you know, today uh, we're still open for business. We're still um, seeing, you know, quite a few patients, but a lot of the things that we do that generate revenue, elective surgeries, we're not doing. So our revenue stream is, you know, significantly impaired. Um, yet in some instances we're, you know, called to action even greater. So our workload really hasn't decreased, but our ability to you know, generate revenue has decreased a lot. So, you know, it adds an additional level of, of stress to what we're doing, but, but certainly we're called to do the right thing and are trying to answer that call the best we can. Understanding that you're not a doctor, but I'll toss this question out anyway, is what we're doing working? I mean, as a society here in Wyoming. So again, I, I think it is. So uh, I think we are seeing um, positive impact from the things that we are, are doing. Um, and, but with that, I would, I would say, look, we, we can always do a little bit more, right? So to the extent we're all washing our hands, um, you just need to ask yourself, you know, should I have washed my hands one more time today that I just, an opportunity that I missed? Uh, to the extent we're all social distancing, I think we're doing a good job with that, but can we do it a little bit more? Can I, instead of going out to the grocery store, you know, three or four times a week, can I reduce it to one or two times a week? So again, I definitely think it's working. Um, proud of everyone's efforts in our community to uh, to really take this seriously. But uh, again, I just uh, challenge everyone to think a little bit more about what's one more thing I can do to make a positive impact. 